So I'm, I'm really happy that we could bring you Nathan Law today. Nathan has been a leader of the Hong Kong democracy movement since the Umbrella Movement in 2014. Um, and obviously, we've been tracking uh, on this podcast the, the, the really tra tragic developments there, uh, just as we follow the really hopeful uh, movement that Nathan's been a part of. But Nathan, thanks so much for, for joining us. Yeah, thanks um, for the invitation. So I, I just wanted to start. You um, you were in the UK, where I know you, you're seeking asylum, and um, to just kind of situate people, um, I, I was wondering if you could share kind of what what goes into that thought process. How do how do you make the determination to take that that formal step? I know you've been outside of Hong Kong a lot in recent years, but that formal step of seeking asylum in another country, and what does that say about what's happening in Hong Kong now? Yeah, that, that was definitely a very difficult decision for me. I, I left Hong Kong at the end of June, which uh, was uh, just before the implementation of the national security law, because we knew that uh, the national security law would be extremely um, draconian and controversial. Um, for now, uh, after half years of its implementation, uh, we can easily see that it prosecutes people by their speech and basically quash uh, the freedom of expression or your political thoughts in Hong Kong. So for me, um, I, I thought that it's extremely important for us uh, to have an international recognizable figure to be able to speak for Hong Kong freely, um, free from the threats of the national security law. So I... Um, decided to leave Hong Kong in order to preserve a voice, which I think is um, definitely very important. And I have left behind my families, my friends. Um, I have cut ties with my family immediately after I left Hong Kong. And um, for now, um, it, it's been difficult, but I think uh, it's more than my personal choice. Well, yeah, I think we you know, have great admiration for the uh the work you're doing, the, the sacrifices you're making, as well as obviously people back in Hong Kong. Uh, on the national security law, uh, what, what has been, for, for people obviously who are not in Hong Kong, what, what do you think has been the, the clearest change since it went into effect? Is it the detentions? Is it, is it some other aspect of governmental power? How, how do you see the national security law having changed the landscape in Hong Kong? Well, the, the national security law basically um, grants the government sweeping power to prosecute anyone that they feel like they have a threat to the national security. For example, the subversion. version, um, just um, a couple of weeks ago, more than 50 democratic figures were arrested because uh, the government thought that they are participating uh, in a uh, um, subversive act by um, involving in a primary. So you could see from this case, um, you exercise your constitutional rights to be involved in an election in order to get majority and you wanted to block government's bill and budget and that kind of intention and actions are subversive acts in government's um, um, dictionary. So you can see how fake and how arbitrary the implementation of the national security law is and um, it could really impose a, a white terror and as politics of fear in Hong Kong. So in Hong Kong, um, people are very reluctant to express their genuine political opposition to the government now because they just don't know when and where and how they are being indicted under the national security law. And the maximum penalty of the law is lifelong imprisonment. So that is very scary. And, and the government use it as a thought control tool and a, a, a mechanism to wash out all the opposition. Yeah, I mean, I've had the experience of, t of talking to friends in Hong Kong who I've talked to about politics over the years, who since the national security law have kind of said to me, well, I got to be careful how I talk to you about politics now because I I'm talking to a foreigner and it could be deemed subversive. Um, that, that just shows you, I mean, people must, this is just an, uh, like the determination about what's subversive is a totally arbitrary one, right? And so in a way, there's no limit to what the the Hong Kong government and what, frankly, the CCP can do through through the Hong Kong authorities, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, and if you look back to uh, the cases that uh, the government arrest those arrestees under the name of national security law, some of them were just displaying slogans of the movement. Some of them were chanting it. Most of them are speech crime. Uh, people did not commit in violent acts or even actions 
that may lead to any like um threats to like national security, but just displaying certain slogans. So we could really see how harsh it is being implemented. And and in Hong Kong now, the so-called division of power, judicial independence, and the accountability of the government are now turned into the Chinese way of governance. Uh, they are not existing anymore. And we've seen, you know, you you came to global attention during the Umbrella Movement, and, and, and you were very close, obviously, to, to Joshua Wong, um, who we've seen detained. We've seen him you know, sentenced, uh, you know, threatened with life sentence, and we see him shackled. Uh, do you have any sense of, of, of how he is doing, what his condition is, how he's being held, what, what, what his legal uh, pr- prospects are? Yeah, I, since I left Hong Kong, I'm unable to contact with my fellow activists that we have worked um, for years, like Joshua Wong, because I don't want them to be endangered. Um, and the government could accuse them um, when they connected to me, saying that they are um, colluding with my foreign activism. So I just don't want to put them in, in danger, especially I'm now wanted by the uh, Hong Kong government um, because they said that I have broken the national security law. So um, I, I, I don't really have first-hand information, but I um, know about his condition through friends. He's doing okay in the cell, but the problem is, and uh, as I've already expect, uh, uh, predicted, when he was convicted uh, to 13.5 months because of um, uh, participating in a peaceful rally in 2019, he was convicted last month uh, to this sentence. Um, we just don't know when he, he could come out from the jail mm. because um, the last mass arrest in Hong Kong, he was one of them who got arrested under the national security law. When the police raided his home, he was still in jail. He, he, he didn't even know it. Yeah. And afterwards, he was brought to a police station um, and to be inquired. Um, so you can see the government is actually targeting these uh, activists. They want to pile up all the charges and, and sentencing on them. Um, Joshua is not only facing 13.5 months of sentencing, but possibly years uh, afterwards uh, when these national security law cases came out a verdict. So I guess that, 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 that is very terrifying and, and that kind of um, mental fear that don't know when he can get out, I think, torturing him a lot. Yeah, no, it's something. Uh, well, the the eyes of the world need to stay uh, on on not just that case, but all these cases in Hong Kong. Uh, in terms of the where the movement goes from here, um, you know, I remember I was the last time I was in Hong Kong was around the district council elections when there was this kind of sweeping, you know, validation of the fact that public opinion in Hong Kong supported the the movement for democracy, the movement against the extradition law, the the, the protest movement that captured the eyes of the world. Um, and obviously, we've now seen the response of the authorities in the in the national security law. So, what what happens next? Uh, the, the the mass mobilization that we had seen throughout uh, 2019 obviously was harder to do under COVID and um, is is more risky to do under the national security law. Many people like yourselves uh, are are in exile. Where 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 do you see in in the, in the near term at least? the movement for democracy, the movement for, for human rights and civil liberties in Hong Kong going? It's already been a year since uh, the police force last approved um, a, a rally in Hong Kong. So for for the last whole year, um, the government has not been approving any rallies and, and the rights of people, right for demonstration is gone. And um, plus the COVID, it's much more difficult for people to protest and they will face huge risk under the national security law. So I guess um, the movement now has already stepped into a rather low tides. Um, we all know that social movement has its own cycle that we've got high points and low points. It's like a pendulum. Yeah. So um, for now, the, the government has been uh, manipulating all these um, li- nearly um, sweeping power to quash the movement and and for people in Hong Kong, they are, uh, it's just like a storm coming and they have to lie low and to seek opportunity in the future. So I guess uh, for now, the, the four is outside Hong Kong, which could really speak free from the national security law, um, became much more important than before. That's why um, for now I could stay 
um, in this particular podcast, talking to you without the fear that the, the police will raid my house on the next morning. And I could say demands like sanctioning the government officials, um, banning them from traveling to, from the world, um, putting more accountability to uh, the way Chinese government acts globally in this podcast. Because if I were staying in Hong Kong and um, I spell up these demands and I would immediately be arrested. Yeah. Well, you know, it makes sense that, 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 that as you say, that things have been flow and the voices uh, uh, on, on these issues may increasingly, for the time being, be outside of Hong Kong. T- to that point, um, you know, this podcast will run tomorrow, the day that Joe Biden is being inaugurated as, as president of the United States. Um, what, would you, what would be your advice to him and his team in terms of, of, of what the United States can do? Um, uh, obviously, we can't solve this problem. Um, but, but what would you like to see the Biden administration do um, to support the people of Hong Kong? I think that the Biden administration is keen to um, preserve a rather assertive approach to China. And I'm really glad to see it. And I am really hopeful that um, a stronger cross-Atlantic um, um, alliance could be forged and a much more multilateral approach could be deployed in order to effectively constrain China. I think the problem is uh, when we um, go back to problems, issues like climate change and public health, and it's undoubtedly we need certain interaction with China. Will this interaction become um, such a, a kind of like leverage for China to yeah. escape those accountability and monitor by the global community and the US in specific? Yeah. I think this is something that uh, poses certain worries. And on the other hand, um, uh, the Biden administration would rejoin a lot of um, cross international um, organizations. And China, of course, um, they know how to play the game in these organizations and they have taken a lot of advantages by um, pooling a lot of, for example, third world countries together and to become a very significant um, playmaker in, in this organization to, to alleviate um, those monitoring and, and tension in it. So uh, is the Biden administration ready to bring some reform proposal back in these organizations in order to build up a stronger uh, monitoring and account, uh, uh, holding China accountable um, by, uh, by like being situated in these um, international organizations. And I, I think this, uh, well, for, um, for, for, for Hong Kong Antifas and people who really do hope that the world could do more to hold China accountable, to um, urge them to play by the rules and uh, respect human rights, uh, internally and externally, would we'll, we'll love to see uh, much more sophisticated multilateral ways of dealing with China and um, understanding uh, how China is manipulating the system and try to fix it. And do you think one way, I mean, obviously, you know, President Trump's administration was very belligerent towards China, you know, took a lot of actions on Hong Kong, particularly over the course of the last year. But there was a sense, you know, that it wasn't coordinated with other countries, particularly. Um, I mean, do you think that that part of what needs to, uh, you know, and this may be a leading question, but that the 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 U.S. needs to try to multilateralize this attention on Hong Kong and this pressure on Hong Kong? That do you think the Chinese government would listen more if it wasn't just say the U.S. doing it alone, but trying to build coalitions of of countries and and businesses and others to do this? Definitely, I I think coalition is the key point. Um, for now, um. China sees the U.S. as the rest zone, which means the enemy. Um, they're not going to, um, well, pay efforts to try to pull them closer. But for example, in EU, they see it as a great zone, which there is a possibility to pull them as friends. So I guess um, in the upcoming ensuing times, China will spend a lot of energy in putting European countries, especially those um, they are economic ties are closer to China into their camp and try to resist that um, kind of um, a force of holding them accountable in, in the future. And I think that's exactly the region that we have to um, get the help, get, 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 get the attention and um, deploy orchestrated um, measures and, and tactics to combat that authoritarian expansion from China. 
So um, unity and, and alliance, I think, is a crux and is vital in terms of combating the growing authoritarian regime. And I think this is not only for the people in Hong Kong, not only for the people in Xinjiang in concentration camp or uh, on the Chinese soil, it is about global democracy. Uh, when we have been talking about the re reset um, uh, of global democracy, I think the, the, the major reason is we actually fed those uh, authoritarian regimes. We thought that they were by opening up the democracy, um, interacting more with the uh, globalized world, they would eventually become open. Yeah. But I think the history proves us wrong. Um, they are actually um, being spoon fed and walk up into a growing legitimacy, growing power, and the world seems reluctant to react to it. So I think for now, if we want to safeguard our democracy, if we want to rebuild the legitimacy of liberalism and democratic values, the first step to do is to be united, to say it out loud that authoritarian regime is, is not something that we will let them do whatever they want and we should hold them accountable because they have violated our basic human rights and freedoms. So I guess that kind of like coalition and, and very orchestrated way of combating with authoritarian regime should be seen as a global challenge and it needs global leadership. And I really do hope that the Biden administration could take up that role and to be very strong towards the expansionist um, CCP authoritarianism. Well, and just you know, a couple more questions. Um, the there's also the the, the global movement against authoritarianism, and I, I've been struck on this podcast. We had a woman on, you know, who's been following things very closely in Belarus, saying that the protesters in Belarus were surprised to get a, a flood of support from people in Hong Kong uh, on social media. Mm. Um, when I was in Hong Kong, I got a sense that the people there were following things in in Chile. Uh, it, 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 what it, you know now we see Alexei Navalny obviously return very you know courageously to to to, to Russia yeah. to confront Vladimir Putin. To, to as you've gone on this journey of of fighting authoritarianism, you know where you're from in Hong Kong, do do you feel like a, there's now this global movement that you are a part of that you know Alexei Navalny is a part of and that you know uh, uh, people in Belarus are a part of and you know basically people anywhere are fighting authoritarianism. Is there a global movement and 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 can it be better kind of coordinated in a, in a, in a way to, to, to overcome all the obstacles it faces? Um, I think for now, um, on the grassroots level, there are a lot of communication in between uh, resistant camps in authoritarian regimes and, and, and those who are fighting for democracy. I've had dialogue with uh, activists from, from Thailand. I've been uh, keeping my eyes on uh, the resistance in Belarus and some other places. I think it's important that we have to share an idea that democracy and freedoms are globally shared values and we have to defend it together instead of being scattered. But I think that kind of understanding, it is not being grasped by um, upper level politics. We still see a very fragmented way of dealing with authoritarian regimes, even though grassroots activists, we are um, talking to each other, we're respecting each other. But I think um, for this to be successful, it has to be with uh, the cooperation of um, the governments, the, yeah. the democratically elected and democratic governments yeah. to really work on uh, very coordinated strategies and also being really loud that um, we, we stand with the people who fight, who fight for democracy and we stand with these values. So I, I guess um, that is a bridge that has to build. And I've been outreaching to a lot of government officials and um, trying to get the support to Hong Kong. And it has been doing, I, I think, quite well. I, I think um, even though for now we, we, we're still not yet to a stage that we are very like consolidated alliance, but I think we're building up that momentum, making it as a global issue and making a global effort on it. And, and just from, you know, obviously we're, you know, the, in the United States, we've lived through a pretty interesting, you know, couple of weeks here. What, what is, when you see something like what happened at the Capitol, um, what does that look like to someone like you, who's obviously recognizes how precarious democracy is and, and what's your advice to us about, you know, uh, getting our own democracy together? A lot of Hong Kong people witness Hong Kong, um, fall from, um, 
a free city. We, we, we were praised as one of the freest city in Asia, even though we have never had democracy and being praised as a pearl of Orient for that case. And we've fallen to a position that people are no longer, they, they can no longer speak freely. People will be prosecuted because they exercise their constitutional rights to participate in election. Um, a slogan, displaying slogan can be seen as threatening national security and face possible lifelong imprisonment. We're fallen into this place and um, is a painful lesson that the experience for past few years teaches us we should we should not take freedom for granted. We should be really vigilant towards the injustice in the society. I think that is the lesson learned. Um, many of the people in the US or UK, they are born, born in um, a democratic country and um, they, they seem not to realize that how quick it can fall um, when the power is handed to people who do not respect democratic values. So I guess um, I really do hope that by, by actually mobilizing our movement into an international level, it is not only raising awareness to China's global um, aggression and threats, not only to the miserable conditions of the uh, Xinjiang concentration camp and the courageous fight of Hong Kong people, but also as an alarming signal to um, the Western democracies, to the people there, we should not take freedom for granted. Um, the cost of freedom is our responsibility and our eternal vigilance towards injustice. So um, I really do, do hope that, um, we, uh, well, of course, in, in recent weeks, there are the storming to the capital is really devastating for people uh, witnessing outside. But we can also see that the checks and balances in the US system still exist, although um, um, people say that it, it is barely existing, but it still exists. We, we're stepping into a transfer of power rather peacefully. And this is a golden standard of how sta stable a democratic system and how, how functional it is. So if I were to witness from an outsider angle, outside the perspective, even though there are worrying incidents, we, we really have to look into why those in incidents, the storming took place and tackle it. But on the other hand, uh, we have seen the tenacity of the, the system that we managed to have a transfer of power, even though with some dramas, but it, it's still there. So I guess um, that that's something that I, that I learned from the past few weeks by following very closely to US, US politics. Yeah. Well, look, I, I really appreciate this conversation. Um, I, I've admired you for, for some time. Um, and I frankly look back at 2014 during the Umbrella Movement. Um, you know, we, you're right. We were focused on uh, the Obama administration getting a climate change agreement, right? Um, and, uh, and obviously we spoke about the Umbrella Movement, but, but you know, that, that there's always some big issue you want to work with the Chinese government on. And I think yeah. the message from you that, that, people like me and hopefully my former colleagues who are going back in the government take is th th this is the highest priority <laughs> because if we lose yeah, yeah. if we lose democracy you know we're not going to deal with climate change and we're not going to deal with the economy and 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 I've learned that from activists like you um that 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 what needs to change in the US is not just one policy it's not a sanction or this it's a mindset of how you, your hierarchy of of interests um and you have to care as much about what's happening in Hong Kong or, or uh, to the Uyghurs as, as you rightly care. You should care about climate change. Yeah. Maybe, you know. um, um, so I, I just wanted to say that to you um, as some um, as someone who's followed your career for a while. And and thank you for for talking to us. And and, you know, you, you've got an, uh, you're a welcome invitation to keep spreading the message here. Thank you so much. I, I really do, do hope that in, in the future that I um the administration and activists like us, we, we could keep contact and, and, and to really explore ways to strengthen um, the support to, to Hong Kong democracy and also ways to combat the, the authoritarian expansion from China. That'd be great. I, I, I really hope that that I hope that those links are strong in the Biden years and, uh, uh, and that we can can start making some progress. So thanks so much for joining us. Great. Thank you so much.